G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle, and I'm in a much better mood today. It's Sunday. I've still got to move those logs from yesterday, from the trees that I've been chopping up and cutting down on the property, but we're getting there, we're getting there. So, uh, Games Workshop put out an article that uh, mentions the pre-orders are up now, but they finally decided to add in, it's pretty much identical to last week's article, they've just added the pre-order buttons in. But they've added in little stars that if you go right the way down to the bottom of the article, it says that these products have been delayed in Australia and New Zealand because reasons. Uh, probably just a huge shortfall uh, in product, basically. Uh, they never seem to have enough of anything at the moment. They're in not a very good place. So, anyway... Yesterday, I had a quite uh, ranty opinion piece based around this Spruce and Bruise article being the worst offender in the current book, but one of many offenders I've seen of late that just, uh, they lie through omission is, is the way I like to think of it. So when it comes to reviews, and I want to do a little bit more balanced take on what I was talking about in my ranty one o'clock in the morning sleep inebriated uh, state when you're doing a review of something you've got to give a balanced review or else it's not useful information because a review is supposed to be a metric by which people can make judgment calls as to whether or not they purchase a product if you leave out the bad and you only leave in the good then it paints an overly rosy picture of something and this becomes very frustrating if you then go out and purchase it and it doesn't live up to those expectations now, this doesn't mean that you have to come in like like I do, um, because, you know, my outer circle character is my personality, just dialed up to 11 or 12. That's it, right? But you don't need to come in at that level and be like, this is effing S and blah, 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 right? You don't have to tear the hell out of something. But you at least need to acknowledge the issues with something, and there are many different ways you can do that. Uh, you could turn around and say, for example, you know, we found that this set of rules was quite underwhelming and it probably needs a drastic rework before we can really recommend it. That's it. It's not scathing critique that's going to uh, tear apart the company and potentially lose you access to the vaunted free stuff because many channels um, and blogs have built their identity around getting free stuff. And uh, they rely on that as the draw to their channel to get people to come in and to have a look at what they're working on uh, in order to make revenue. And so I was very displeased to read yet another uh, review blog article, post, video, you name it, they're everywhere right now. It's an epidemic of people who just omit the truth. Uh, integrity seems to be lacking. Now, another thing I do in the background is I go around and I talk to people. I talk to people because I want to understand their viewpoint. It doesn't mean I'm going to agree with their viewpoint, but I at least want to hear them out and understand it. Um, so one of the other people that I briefly spoke with, just in on a post, and actually it was a post linking to this very article, um, was Pardo from um, SL, uh, uh, sorry, SM Battle, Battle Reports. Uh, which do 30k battle reports on YouTube, and they too get a lot of free stuff from the company, which again makes you raise an eyebrow, because we all know that the Games Workshop get free stuff from us agreements tend to be very pro-Games Workshop. And he, uh, one of the people on there said, you know, they'd cancelled buying this book because they had seen the rules of Shadow Legion. They said, look, that's not what I want out of my Shadow Legion, so I'm not interested in the book anymore. And he said, don't. It's an amazing book. So I asked the question, well, what do you define as amazing? And it's very interesting to see the response that he gave um, because it gives you a bit more understanding of where people are coming from. And his response was, well, it's got a lot of content. You know, This is me greatly boiling down his response, but it was only a couple sentences long. There's a lot of content, over 200 pages. So, okay, so content. Content is how we're defining good or bad, is it? Because that's not how I define good or bad. But it is a category that you would plug into a review. It is something you might mention. 
So I mentioned in my review for the Exemplary Battles uh, of the Horus Heresy Volume 1 book, that was a very small book a lot of content. Same with the Book 9 review I did uh, way back then for the Dark Angels. I said, look, this book is small. So content is key, uh, in at least lengthwise. But just like with a movie, we don't necessarily say that a movie is good because it is long, do we? We have to still judge it as a movie, but we make note of the length. We say whether or not it feels like a long movie, whether or not it feels like a short movie, uh, whether or not it used its time poorly, whether the movie feels like it was worth the money we paid for it because it was too short. Uh, these are all factors. The same thing when it comes to the Horace Heresy reviews. When we're reviewing the book, great if it's 200 pages long. But what did it do with those 200 pages? Did it use them wisely is the question. And nobody wants a short book that's badly written. That's the worst possible iteration. Uh, a long book that's badly written is probably next worst, followed by a short book that is well written, followed by a long book which is well written. That's sort of the order of things. So length does have some correlation here, but to me it's not a huge factor. I'm not going to call something amazing just because it's long. Okay, the Twilight series is long. <laughs> You know, um, and we're probably not going to go out and call it a literary masterpiece, although it's made the author an incredible amount of money. And another thing brought up was the campaigns. And this leads me into, you know, an important thing when it comes to these reviews and these topics in general, which is value is in the eye of the beholder. And a good review will give you the information to make the choice of whether or not something is essentially what you want. And there are going to be trade-offs. Everything in life has trade-offs. And you need to make judgment calls based upon whether or not you're happy to accept the trade-offs. So if I say to you, you can buy two cars. Um, and we're going to review these cars fairly. One car has beautiful interior, feels luxurious, you know. But reliability-wise, absolutely awful. It's going to be in the shop every second week. Or... You can have a car which is mechanically incredibly reliable, but it feels very cheap on the interior. It's a little bit uncomfortable, you know. You aren't going to be taking long drives in it. Different people with different priorities are going to pick different vehicles. But those trade-offs are important. But if I omit some of that information, I say, well, this one has excellent mechanical reliability. This one has poor mechanical reliability. Then I'm not telling them about the interior. Or vice versa, I say, this car has an excellent interior, this one has a horrible interior, you're sitting on a beanbag in the car, and people aren't told about the mechanical reliability, then they might say, pick the luxurious one, because they go, oh, I want the nice interior, I want to be comfortable. Okay, but you haven't told them a very important fact about the vehicle. Well, it's the same with reviews. You can't put out reviews and just omit the information. If there is information that people need to know, then you've got to put it in there. Okay, when I did a review just a few weeks ago uh, on the Creality uh, K1 Max 3D printer, in the end, I said I, I like the printer. I'm happy with the printer, and I would happily get another one of it. In fact, I've got two. And I used two printers for that review because I wanted to test. Let's, let's see, you know, instead of getting lucky or unlucky with one printer, two means twice the chance of something going right or wrong, right? So... I did my review, and in that review, I talked about the basic features of the printer, and then I talked about all the things I wish that they had done better. And that took up about half the duration of the video, the things that went right and wrong with that printer. Um, there was a certain fault that occurred on it. There were issues with the software that I didn't like, uh, regards to slicing. Went through these things. That's what you've got to do in a review, okay? And the company, to their credit, were mature about it. When I showed them that review, they didn't insist on changing anything. They didn't say, no, we don't like this. They didn't say, we're terminating any relationship we have with you. They said, yeah, that's, those are some fair points. Okay, Doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to act on them, but at least they said those are some fair points. We don't get that with Games Workshop. They know that the customer is sort of bent over the barrel uh, over the years. They've cultivated a relationship where... 
basically they can spit out whatever product they want and the customer is pretty much just going to consume the product and sit on it. Whereas something like the video games industry, yes, that can occur, but more often than not, especially with a new game, if a new game drops and it's got some major flaws, some major issues on releasing, many developers will go back to the drawing board and say, all right, we need to take another hit at this. A uh, good example of that, probably the best example of a company doing it perfectly is No Man's Sky. So um, No Man's Sky released and was it was a cluster. Let's be honest. Uh, it was in a very poor place, poor state, uh, but the company just went away. They didn't make a bunch of social media posts. They just put their heads down and got to work and then quietly worked away in the background for many months and then released patch after patch, turned it into a totally new game, where it is still got fantastic numbers of people playing because they completely reinvented it. Fantastic, right? But we don't with Games Workshop. We see a degree of hubris in the company, and especially in the writing teams, where they just don't take the critique on board. They don't come in and go, yep, yeah, we majorly stuffed up certain rules. Let's rework them. They don't want to do that because once they've put it into writing, they're like, well, look, it's in writing. It is what it is. It's not going to sell more models, um, for us to rework it. And it's like, well, it's not about selling more models. It's about delivering the customer satisfaction part of the experience, something that is just sorely lacking with Games Workshop. The after-sales support is just not there. And that's something you can't shy away from. That is a fact. That is a reality of the hobby scene. And, you know, they're only going to get the feedback that they need to get if people are honest in their reviews and everyone should be shouting from the rooftops when something is wrong and at the same time when they nail something and they get it right we should also be shouting that from the rooftops i have many episodes on this channel although uh, if you were to believe the memes they don't exist i'm only ever salty but i have many episodes where i talk about the good things that they've done the things they've got right they when they are playing the game with the customer, right? And they're playing uh, their part in the in a mutual relationship. That's, you know, that's the goal. That's the dream. That's when they're doing it right and they deserve the praise for it. The problem is, is they don't do that very often. You know, we have situations in this book, right? Where there are just weird rules and you know that someone just didn't think them through. And I will sit here and I'll scream the high heavens. This is terrible writing this is bad writing how can these writers still be employed right because that's my character being dialed up my personality at, at level 11 level 12 right but my actual you know this is me just normal james human being talking to you right not the outer circle character my normal personality is like look that's a very incompetent move how did you let it get to this in the first place if I was overseeing the department, that I wouldn't actually fire people. I'd be saying, all right, how do we stop this from happening again? And then after it happens again, then it's like, all right, you're on your last chance, third time and you're out type thing. Then I'll be looking at firing people. Because as one example, the solar auxilia um, and such are in this book, uh, as well as the Astartes. And if you're playing the, essentially these are Chthonium missions in the book. If you're playing those and... Uh, using this onslaught system, you can take an extra ally detachment is one of the, the buffs that it gives you. The problem is, though, that in the last FAQ they dropped for the system, they said you can have infinite ally detachments. And on top of extra ally detachments, they can all be the same legion. You could have uh, Dark Angels allied with Imperial Fists, with Imperial Fists, with Imperial Fists, with Imperial Fists, etc., etc., right? And then they make a specific point in this book of saying, hey, in this campaign system, you can have an extra ally detachment. Well, I could anyway. Like, what, are you, <laughs> what is the message you're trying to send me here? You clearly don't read your rules. And so that is something that should make it into a review. Same as I said with the uh, bookkeeping. The bookkeeping, you've got 54 different traits that have to be kept track of for Shattered Legions. That's going to boil down to nine traits based on the three that you pick for your actual Shadow Legion formation, uh, assuming you're not allying in other forces or things like that. Now, that nine traits is going to cycle through the unit based on what the quantity of models are in each unit as the game progresses. 
at the minimum, it's going to be six traits if you're only taking two different legions in your Shattered Legion. But cycling through nine different abilities, you think about that. Nine different abilities that are going to swap and change each phase of the game in both players' turns. So you're shooting at a unit, uh, it's got a bunch of close combat um, and ranged miniatures in there from different legions. And you're shooting at it, you're getting all these buffs and abilities and it's behaving one way and then a certain number of models die and now it's going to behave a different way. And then you, you're like, all right, I'm going to charge this unit and oh, hang on a minute, I went to charge them but um, a number of models uh, died in Overwatch and now my rules have changed and now I've got a different charge bonus. And Like, what, 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 what is going on here? Okay, that's not the way you write rules. So a constructive thought here. What you would do is if you want to create a unit of truly Shattered Legion, where, because Shattered Legion should be run in the way it was last edition, the need to change it so dramatically was pointless because it's easier for the gameplay elements to just take whole units from other legions and put them on the table. Making it by the model is too convoluted. It's thematic, but it's convoluted, and there has to be some compromise given to the gameplay value. If you want to have a unit which cycles through different legion rules over time as the unit's numbers fluctuate, you make that its own unit. You don't make it every single unit in the army. You make it its own unit, and you make it an exemplary battles in the Age of Darkness unit. Exemplary battles, shattered tactical squad, something like that. And as the you pick the different legions that, that tactical squad is made with, and as the game goes on, it changes its rules. It's a chimera unit, as it were. Cool, that's something you can work with. But doing it army-wide is not a wise choice. And so there were people who did talk about this correctly, uh, unlike in this article, the Spruce and Brews one, which I think was just... Well, you read it. Um, I mean, the summary... Right, the summary in the Spruce and Brews um, basically says that um, the book nicely expands the units that the Solar Auxilia have, and blah blah blah, and um, it's all good things. It gives some considerable lore and decent campaign format in order to give your game some narrative structure. It's another great supplement to the Horus Heresy. Well, it'd be good because that'd be the first great supplement the Horus Heresy 2.0 has had, because we all have seen Siege of Cthonia, and we know it was pretty lacking. And we all read the Exemplary Battles uh, Volume 1 with the Traitor Emperor's Children, and we know that that book was terrible, probably the worst release in the entire heresy, uh, to date, the entire of heresy. So this review didn't do anything. It didn't give us anything of actual value. And of course, it's talking about plastics and a bunch of other stuff. So the, the review covers many different things, um, and I think really need to be broken up. And I don't think, don't no hate towards the reviewer either, okay? Um, I just don't like the omission thing. That's my personal pet peeve. I would rather be the most hated man on YouTube but have my integrity than to tow some other company's line because if it all turns to crap and Games Workshop is... Um, they're not going to be there to support you, basically. If you, the, the, the people who read the reviews decide that your opinion means nothing because you've lied to them through a mission too many times and they move away from you, your revenue stream gets cut away, Games Workshop's not going to be there to prop up your revenue stream and keep your separate reviewing company open. They're not going to keep sprues and brews open, okay? Games Workshop is only facilitating your reviews, you need to give people exactly what they want. And I'm not saying you're in any danger of this right now or that this is not an aberration, but there is that risk at the end of the day that if you annoy enough people, they don't come back and watch your channel. If they don't come back to watch your channel, your channel dies. And the company that you've sucked up to won't be there to pick up the pieces. You have to be. Now, who did a good review? Well... I think Goonhammer actually did a really good review on the book, and I ended up very late in the morning, late at night, the early morning, like, as I was saying, the time that I was critiquing um, what was happening Spruce and Brews, I was looking at the leaked pictures from inside the book, the couple of those that had gone around, including the 54 different Shadow Legion traits, and in here... Um, 
we actually get some real actual commentary saying foremost among the thoughts is the question, how and why did this happen? Because these rules don't seem playable. Oddly, the designers seem to think the same, so they've given us a big note at the start of the section warning us not to use these rules in a competitive environment or whenever time is a factor. And time is a factor at narrative events and even club nights, assuming you get chucked out at some point, so for me, this pretty much rules out the army. That's fantastic. That's exactly what you want to be reading in a review. Because it's telling you, look, even the people who wrote this know that there are issues with it. Now, it doesn't go as far as saying that, so why did they release it in the first place? And they don't have to, because they've now informed the person who is reading the article that, okay, there are issues with the Shattered Legions, so if I was pinning all of my hopes in this book on running Shattered Legions, I am probably going to be upset or disappointed with them. Great, fantastic. They don't need to go any more into depth than that in summary format. But, of course, they've gone into more depth and they explain in some detail how certain things work, including some examples where they don't work. Fantastic, that's what we want to be seeing. And because of that, we're able to build up a good picture of how these actual things function. And they also say that, look, the rest of the book is better than this. So cool, great. So they're telling us that, look, this is a huge negative. There's a huge downside to this um, part of the book. You know, if you're into Shadow Legions, this is just not going to work. But, you know, if you're into Black Shields and the other stuff, then, hey, it's it's pretty good. Perfect. That's what should be inside a, inside a review. Uh, and so full praise to Goonhammer for nailing down the correct way to review and the tone in this one. Uh, and I want to see more articles from different people like that in the future. Anyway, um, that's my thoughts for today. A much more, uh, well, for a start, I've had some sleep <laughs> and I'm less grumpy, um, but a much more relaxed Macca because it's Sunday. I've got a bunch of yard work still to do and I'm going back to work tomorrow. But, you know, Easter at the end of the week, uh, so that means Easter stream. And, of course, April 1st is coming up. I've always got a video for April 1st. This year it's going to be pretty spicy. So let's hope I don't get into too much trouble on the interwebs for that one. Anyway, that's it for me. I am James with The Outer Circle. And I'll see you on the next video.